This is going to be Psalms chapter 11, and I'm going to look at the subject, Recuperating After a Spiritual Battle. In Psalms 11 and verse 1, it says, To the chief musician, a psalm of David, In the Lord put I my trust. How shall ye say to my soul, Flee as a bird to your mountain. Number one, after a spiritual battle, you need to run to your prayer closet. Now, Psalms 118 and 8 says it is better to trust in the Lord than, than to put confidence in man. In Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, it says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lead not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. In Job 13, 15, it says, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. So if you trust him, then why should you flee to your mountain? As it says in verse 1, this is because the Lord wants you to run off by yourself at times to pray and get something out of the Bible. Open your Bible and read a little bit, then pray a little bit. After a spiritual battle, whether you had victory or failure, you need to get in your prayer closet, wherever that is, maybe in your car, your bathroom, your living room, wherever. Most times it's easy to pray after a failure, but you forget sometimes after a victory. You forget to be as zealous after a big victory. You kind of let your guard down. But when the Lord's fame was spread ab abroad, he didn't just go and celebrate. It says in Luke five fifteen and 16, But so much the more went there a fame abroad of him, and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. And he withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed. So you have to run to your mountain and get something from the Word of God. You have to get an energy boost. You have to listen to some, some preaching. Most people only listen to preaching at church, but you can listen to preaching anytime. Go to goodpreaching.com and get some sermons for your iPhone, some Bible-believing sermons. You can go to YouTube and find these things. Listen to King James Bible preaching. Flee to your mountain. Get alone with God for a while. Running isn't always a bad thing. People think it's unmanly to run away from some things. But sometimes you're fleeing because you know in this old flesh you can't handle the devil. Uh, Michael didn't bring against him a railing accusation. And many times Paul mentions fleeing from something. In 1 Corinthians 6.18 it says flee fornication. In 1 Corinthians 10.14 it says flee from idolatry. In 2 Timothy 2.22 it says flee also youth, youthful lusts. A lot of men say, oh, I can be around all these things and they don't bother me. But they're lying. It rubs off on you. Evil communications corrupt good manners. It takes a bigger man to flee from something than for him to s stick around and entertain those thoughts of, until he ends up doing it. Joseph could have laid with Potiphar's wife, but he decided to flee. Do you know how much better your life would be if you ran away to your mountain? Wherever that is, get alone with God, and when temptation comes, you can flee. These psalms are going to be so real for the saint in the time of Jacob's trouble. Every chapter I study of psalms makes the Bible even more real to me because it can have application for any saint in any age. But those Jews are going to flee the Antichrist in the time of Jacob's trouble. They're going to flee to their mountain, just like in Psalms 11. Matthew 24, 15, and 16, you have in Matthew 24 where Jesus is telling the disciples about the end. And it says, When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. See, that's those Jews they are going to flee the Antichrist into the mountains. And that matches what we're talking about here in Psalms 11. Now, Psalms 11, 2, For lo, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string, that they may privily shoot at the upright in heart. So the wicked is the second most talked about character in the Bible that doesn't get much mention in the average message by a preacher or study by a teacher. But he is the mystery of iniquity. And the wicked doth bend their bow. As the verse said in Revelation chapter 6, the first seal is a white horse rider the counterfeit, the counterfeit Christ, the Antichrist, and he has a bow. You can read about that in Revelation 6. And isn't it funny, here in verse 2 it says, For lo, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string, that they may privily shoot at the upright in heart. And that wicked man, 
and the devil, and the devils out of hell, and the fallen angels, and all the workers of iniquity, they hate your guts. First John 3.13 says, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. This present evil world hates a true Bible-believing Christian. They will shoot at you. So if you're going to recuperate from a spiritual battle, you not only need to run to your mountain, you need to raise your shield. If you just lost a battle, or you, even if you had victory in a battle, you need to run to your mountain, you need to raise your shield because they're going to kick you while you're down. Or they'll try to catch you off guard while you're sitting celebrating a victory or something. Ephesians 6.16 says, Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of who? The wicked. Just like in Psalms 11.2 said they're going to shoot you. And they'll shoot you while you're down. They'll even use mind control weapons on your own soldiers and make them kick you while you're down. Other Christians. They'll get that MK Ultra stuff and use that on them. The devil loves to mess with people's mind. If you're going to recuperate from a spiritual battle, victory or loss, you'll have to raise your shield. Raise it and say Romans 8.31, which says, If God be for us, who can be against us? Raise it and say Hebrews 13.5, which says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Raise it and say 1 John 4.19, we love him because he first loved us. Raise it and say First Thessalonians four fourteen through sixteen and seventeen and eighteen, where it talks about the rapture and says, Wherefore comfort one another with these words. Raise your shield and use the Bible to remind yourself why you have faith in the book, and remind yourself that God wrote the book. In first Samuel thirty and verse six, David encouraged himself in the Lord. Most people just discourage you. So you have to let the Lord encourage you. So raise your shield against the fiery darts of the wicked. They've been their bow. After you've lost a spiritual war, like maybe you gave in to temptation, they'll say, well, you already did that. So you might as well just go get drunk with your friends. Or you might as well just go get your rock CDs back and play them. Or you might as well just go cheat on your wife or your husband. But you have to raise your shield. And it will block evil communications. Many times after you just had a victory, you have your guard down, and then they'll shoot the fiery darts of the wicked at you, and, you know, they'll catch you while you're down. But you have to raise your shield of faith. Uh, don't let the devil make you think that since you just failed, that you just need to completely give up. Just get right back into serving God like you were. Do the things that you were doing good to begin with, and just confess your sin and forsake them. In Psalms 11.3, it says, If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? So don't let anybody destroy your foundation. 1 Corinthians 3.11 says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So don't let anybody make you think the Lord has forsaken you. Don't let anybody destroy your Bible. A Bible-correcting preacher is a liar. He wants to destroy your foundation. You have to raise your shield of faith. When that scholar gets up and says your Bible has errors, raise your shield and say, you know, let God be true but every man a liar. Bible correctors destroy a foundation. When a man corrects the book uh, to a new Christian or tells him the Bible has errors, it shakes the new Christian's faith and he's destroying that young Christian's foundation. He's going to have this mindset that he doesn't have a, a perfect Bible. A contemporary church can destroy a foundation, a church with low moral standards, no separation in the wrong Bible. It starts him off on the wrong foot, so you need to run to your hiding place. You need to raise your shield, and next you need to run, or no, next you need to reach the throne room. After a spiritual war, are you doing all you can to reach the throne? In Psalms 11, 4, it says, The Lord is in His holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold. His eyelids try the children of men. Hebrews 10, 19 says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Hebrews 4, 16, Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in, in time of need. So are you doing all you can to reach the throne?
As a born-again believer, you don't need a priest to confess your sins to. You don't have to have a middleman here on earth. There is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, and you have access to approach God with boldness for anything for supplications, prayers, intercessions. And you can confess your sins because He is faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And if you confess confessed up, you can easily reach the throne. Daniel 7, 9 says, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. And if you're a born-again believer, you can reach this throne. You can come boldly to it. So Psalms 11 and 4, The Lord is in His holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, His eyelids try the children of men. After a spiritual battle, you need to get to the throne. Get to this throne room, whether it's after a victory or a loss. You, if it's after a victory, you're going to need help to get another victory. If it's after a failure, you're going to need help not to fail again. But to that, it says the Lord is in His holy temple, and today that temple is you. 1 Corinthians six nineteen and 20 says, What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You have Christ in you, the hope of glory, and there is no reason that you can't get to the throne. You take Him wherever you go, and spiritually you're sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. But, like I said, His holy temple today is in you. It says in verse 4 of Psalms 11, His eyes behold, His eyelids try. He sees you. He knows what you're doing. He sees you start to pray. He sees your lack of prayer. He sees if you're trying to get ready for the next battle. Proverbs 15, 3, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. You think He doesn't see you in every battle you're going through. You think He doesn't see you after your loss or after your victory. Now verse 5 in Psalms 11, The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked in him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. So, there's some things that God hates. God isn't just love. God is love, but to love you have to hate some things. Uh, but God hates certain men. He hates hands that shed innocent blood. He abhors certain people. It, and you need to run to your mountain. You need to raise your shield. You need to reach the throne room. And next, remember, you're on the winning side. Even if you lost a battle, you're still going to win the war. Because in Psalms eleven six it says, Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire, and brimstone. And in horrible tempest, this shall be the portion of their cup. So this is the cup of God's wrath that he will pour on sinful man at the second coming. And we will be behind him on white horses. It says in the book of Jude, Enoch the seventh from Adam prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. And if you're a born-again believer, then you're in the Bible because you're one of those saints. You're one of those ten thousands of saints. And that verse also mentioned a cup. It says, This shall be the portion of their cup, and this is the cup of God's wrath. The more a nation or a people sin, the fuller the cup gets until he pours it out. Just so like in Revelation sixteen nineteen, it says, To give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And that's the second coming. And that's what 2 Thessalonians 1.8 is talking about, where it says, In flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the Lord took your cup if you're saved. Because when He was on the cross, He became sin for us. He took God's wrath. God poured out the cup of wrath on Him. And if you reject the Lord's way out of wrath, then you'll face His wrath. Instead of getting your cup of wrath empty, you'll drink a full cup. But if you're born again, you're on the winning side. And no matter what happens here, you'll win in the end. So remember, you're on the winning side. Not only do you need to remember you're on the winning side, but also righteousness is key. To have any power in future battles, you need to live holy, set apart from the world, and righteous. In Psalms eleven seven, it says, For the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. His countenance doth behold the upright. 
We don't do righteousness to stay saved. We do it because we are saved. Or you ought to anyway. A lot of people say you believe eternal security, so you think you can do whatever you want to do. No, I'm sorry if that is your mindset, but that's not mine. Um, I don't believe I can do whatever I want to just because I do have eternal security. I want to do righteousness because the Lord loves righteousness, not to keep my salvation. But his countenance doth behold the upright. And when you do right, somebody sees it even when no one else does, and that is the Lord. A lot of people do good things that they think go unnoticed, but no good deed will go without a reaping, just like no bad deed will go without a reaping. As it says in Galatians 6, 7 through 8, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh, so of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit, shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. So if you do righteousness today, you'll be ready. You'll already be right and you'll be ready when you see the giant coming. A lot of people don't start getting right till they see the giant right up in their face. And then they're trying to do right. But I want to do right today before something bad happens to me. I don't want to wait until something bad happens. But James 5.16 talks about how the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Proverbs 14.34 says, Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach, reproach to any people. There's nothing more important than doing right. There's nothing more important than your fellowship with the Lord. It's never okay to do wrong. It's never okay to sin just because you're not saved by works. We need to do works. We need to maintain good works. Titus uh, 2, 12 through 13 says, Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So that's when the ultimate soldier calls all of us soldiers home. That's the rapture. And if you want to go out in that rapture, you need to make sure that you're saved. Paul gives us the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have believed, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So if you want to be saved... You need to come to Jesus Christ as a guilty sinner because Jesus Christ died for your sins by shedding his blood. And all you have to do to be saved is come to him and put your trust in him and his work on the cross to be your payment for sin. You have a debt that you owe, a sin debt. And Jesus Christ is the only one that can pay it. So you need to come to him and put your trust in him and what he did on the cross to be your ticket to heaven.